Okay, why don't we get started? I'd like to introduce uh, myself. I'm Ron Friedman, uh, the president of the Jewish Federation of Fort Wayne. I'd like to welcome you all tonight for this very uh, exciting program called Building Bridges of Faith, Photographs of People Visits to the Holy Land. Uh, before we start, I want to make sure we thank our sponsors for uh, tonight's program and also for the exhibit which will be going on for the next 10 days. Uh, the Jewish Federation of Fort Wayne, the Diocese of Fort Wayne South Bend, uh, the Dr. Hay Harry W. Salem Foundation, and the Council General of Israel to the Midwest. So I want to make sure we thank our sponsors. Um, before we actually get to the keynote speaker, there are a few people that we're going to welcome tonight, and uh, two of them will say a few words. Um, we'd like to uh, welcome and introduce Bishop Kevin C. Rhodes of the Diocese of Fort Wayne South Bend. Uh, Bishop Rhodes was appointed Bishop of Fort Wayne South Bend in 2009. He earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy from St. Charles Borromeo Seminary and a bachelor in licensed degrees in sacred theology and a licensed degree in canon law from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He was ordained a priest in 1983. He directed the Spanish apostolate in Dolphin, Cumberland, and Perry counties, served on the faculty of Mount St. Mary's Seminary, and as rector until his 2004 ordination as Bishop of Harrisburg. While serving as Bishop of Harrisburg, Bishop Rhodes was president of the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference and served on the boards of St. Charles Seminary, St. Vincent Seminary, and Mount St. Mary's University. Previously, he served as chair of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family Law, and Youth, and chair of the Task Force on Healthcare. He currently serves as a member of the Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth, and as a consultant to the Committee on Pro-Life Activities. Since 2010, Bishop Rhodes serves as chair of the Board of Directors on Our Sunday Visitor, and he's been a member of the Board of Catholic Relief Services since 2015. So I'd like to welcome Bishop Rhodes, who will say so much, Dr. Friedman. Thank you and for all you do here at the Jewish Federation. And, and to Jackie, thank you so much. You do so much to build a bridge of faith between the Jewish and Catholic communities here in Fort Wayne. So I'm very grateful. Um, I really think that I made a mistake. I should have worn my zucchetto tonight. I would have felt even more at home. You know, it's not a yarmulke in Catholic uh, garb. We call it a zucchetto. Now, I don't know why we changed the name, because it was originally a yarmulke. But I have a purple one. That's what bishops wear. But anyhow. The, um, and I thank you for, and everyone responsible for bringing this wonderful photo exhibit to Fort Wayne. The Papal Visits to the Holy Land, the four Papal Visits, 1964 to 2014. Um, just a little bit of history. Um, it really was an ex very historic when Blessed Pope Paul VI visited the Holy Land. Maybe some people remember, I was about seven years old, but I even remember uh, a little bit uh, at that young age because it was so historic. It was the first time a Pope had left Italy in 150 years. 1812 was the last time, and that time the Pope was uh, taken as a prisoner by Napoleon, so it wasn't a free trip. <laughs> um, but so that was the first time that uh, Pope left left Italy, and, and he's only spent three days in the Holy Land. And um, but it was so uh, historic. The first Pope to go to Jerusalem since Peter, Saint Peter. So now at that time there were no official diplomatic relations with Israel, so it wasn't like uh, the next visit, which was another 36 years later. John Paul wanted to go to the Holy Land uh, since he became Pope, but there were all kinds of political problems. That, so his dream of going there wasn't realized until the Jubilee year 2000, the year 2000. And we know of St. John Paul's love and respect for the Jewish people since his childhood 
uh, in Baro Beach, Sapolin, and his many Jewish friends. Um, and it was very personal. I think it was very emotional for him. Uh, even from the time that he arrived at Ben Gurion Airport, met with the rabbis and the Israeli president. But I remember his watching on TV his visit to Yad Vashem, the, um, and he walked to the eternal flame in the Hall of Remembrance. And by that time, if you recall, by the year 2000, he was pretty frail. So he had his cane and he struggled. Um, and clearly, when he was at that, that place, uh, that Hall of Remembrance, he, he most certainly remembered his Jewish friends who perished in the Holocaust. And he said in, in his remarks there that he came to pay homage to um, the millions of Jewish people who were murdered in the Shoah, to remember in silence. And he talked about remembrance. He said how important it is to remember so never again will evil prevail. Um, he met there with seven Holocaust survivors, and that was very beautiful as well. I'm just, I want to highlight a couple things about the Catholic Jewish uh, part of the business, the whole thing. You'll see in the photos a lot of the Christian sites that the Pope's visit, visited, obviously, but I want to focus on the Catholic Jew, the Jewish part of it. And I'll never forget uh, watching on TV when he prayed at the Western Wall. And I remember praying at the Western Wall. Uh, twice and uh, putting a prayer intention in the crevice of the wall and um, and of course uh, John Paul did that and his prayer intention you know so many pious Jews down through the centuries till today do this and um, he asked forgiveness his prayer that he wrote was asking forgiveness for those who caused suffering to the Jewish people through the centuries, and he, he wrote also uh, of his commitment to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. And I thought that was so beautiful because you know, there's some controversy among some about uh, the covenant. That's a whole other theological thing, but I won't get into that. But I thought it was really significant that he used that language in the petition. Um, when Pope Benedict visited in May of 2009, um, he said something that really struck me. He said that Christianity is born from the Old Testament. And how true that is, the New Testament would not exist without the Old Testament. And of course, Pope Benedict went there, really when you think about it, he's the theologian. So his, his talks were just filled with such beautiful theology. And, um, but I think one of the most memorable things was when he arrived at the airport in Tel Aviv, um, his words against anti-Semitism. I mean, he said basically anti-Semitism is totally unacceptable and we must combat it whenever it raises its ugly head. Um, he also, it's interesting how Pope Benedict, like John, kind of followed a lot of the itinerary of John Paul, so did Pope Francis. And he went to Yad Vashem, and when he went there, he spoke in such a low voice, it was kind of hard to hear him when you're watching on TV, but even the people who were there. But it was extremely solemn. Um, again, he honored the memory of the six million Jews who were killed. And, but one thing he said, again, the theologian, he said people who have lost their lives, um, he, that the people who were honoring have lost, lost their lives but they'll never lose their names. And I thought that was beautiful, he says, because their names are in the hearts of their loved ones, the hearts of their fellow prisoners, and most importantly, their names are forever fixed in the memory of Almighty God. Um, Pope Benedict did the same thing, he met with seven survivors. He also went to the Western Wall to pray, um, and he expressed the church's irrevocable commitment to genuine and lasting reconciliation between Christians and Jews. And it's remarkable to see what's happened in the last 50 years between, uh, especially between Catholics and Jews, how the friendship has, has become so strong. When Pope Francis visited, most of the photos that you'll see in the exhibit, the great majority of Pope Francis's visit, there's some great images of Pope Francis in May of 2014. 
That was the 50th anniversary of Pope Paul VI's visit. And again, he went to the same places and he, but one thing when he went to Yad Vashem, he gave a little homily and he recalled God's words in Genesis, Adam, where are you? And he said, here we are, shamed by what man created in God's image and likeness can do. Never again, Lord, never again. Um, finally, very personally, I was, in, with, I was with 130 some of our young people in Auschwitz-Birkenau in July for, uh, during World Youth Day. Very powerful, powerful visit, a couple hours. And, and our young people, our young Catholics, you know, at various places, they, I would look at even the young men, teenagers and young adults, guys, tears coming down their face. And they would stop at different places and kneel down and pray. It was a very powerful few hours that we spent walking through Auschwitz and, and, Bir and Birkenau. Um, I'm looking forward to going to Israel next month. I'm on the board of Catholic Relief Services, so I'll be there visiting some of our projects, and I really look forward. And um, when I pray at the Western Wall, I mean, I especially pray for the Jewish community here in Fort Wayne for all of you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for your friendship, and thank you for this, uh, this exhibit. And we continue to build bridges of faith. God bless you. Acknowledge and to extend a warm welcome to another of this evening's special guests, uh, Sister Elise Chris. Um, as most of you know, she's been president of the University of St. Francis since 1993. And under her leadership, the university has grown from approximately 1,000 students to over 2,300 students. Uh, the campus has grown substantially, and several new graduate and undergraduate academic programs on campus as well as online have been implemented. Uh, Sister Lee serves on several local and state boards. She's listed on the Who's Who in American Education, is an alumna of Leadership Fort Wayne and the Harvard University Institute for Educational Management. She's received the Ove Jurgensen Spirit of Leadership Award from Junior Achievement, the Athena Award from the Chamber of Commerce, the Janus Award from the Macmillan Center for Health Education, the Distinguished Leadership Award from the Community Leadership Association, the Legend of Leadership Award from Fort Wayne Business Weekly, and the Sagamore, Sagamore of the Wabash from Governor Pence. Uh, Sister Lise has been honored by the YWCA, Channel 21, Business People Magazine, and Fort Wayne Magazine. So please join me in thanking Sister Lise for her many contributions to our community. with us tonight who wanted to say a few words was Itai Milner, the Deputy Counsel General of Israel to the Midwest, another sponsor for tonight's event. Itai Milner assumed the post of Deputy Counsel General at the Consulate General of Israel to the Midwest in August of 2016. As the second highest ranking Israeli official, he coordinates and oversees the political and academic affairs in the nine state region that includes Illinois, Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Indiana. Mr. Milner works with regional, state, and local elected officials. While concentrating on collaborations with universities and colleges, he also creates partnerships and maintains relationships with community leaders throughout the Midwest to enhance Israel's standing and image. Mr. Will Milner has worked for Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a professional diplomat since 2011. And prior to assuming his current position, he served as a Deputy Ambassador of Israel to Serbia and Montenegro, where he was responsible for government relations, trade, and public diplomacy. In addition to English, Itai Milner is also conversant in Serbian. And before joining the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he practiced law and has experience working in Israeli media outlets. Born in Tel Aviv, he obtained his law and business management degrees from Tel Aviv University. And though he has backpacked around the world, we were also told that the Deputy Council General appreciates a quiet evening at home, a 
and he is a food aficionado and also a news junkie. So I'd like to welcome Eitai Wilmer to say a few words. Theologian 
as you can tell from his resume. Uh, the Pontifical Gregorian University is uh, not just a professional school for the preparation of the clergy. And I'm going to talk theology tonight, so I had better be careful. I know that I'm being watched by an expert. Um, I'm very happy to be here, <clears throat> and I'm very happy to be able to speak in the presence uh, of Bishop Rhodes. Um, the first Archbishop of Chicago uh, who visited uh, with me in my home uh, for Shabbat dinner many, many years ago uh, was Joseph Cardinal Bernadine, may rest in peace, a great and good man in so many ways. And when I walked into my home, uh, in the living room there's a bookcase, and on the bookcase are the pictures of my grandparents and my great-grandparents going back many, many generations. Um, and I want to be honest, uh, I did not have a calling to be a rabbi. I went into the family business. Uh, I come from long lines of rabbis on both sides of my family. And I have a son, a rabbi. Um, so uh, uh, his eminence uh, looked at the pictures. These were uh, bearded men in long white beards and caftans going back to the middle of the 19th century. And he said to me, who are these people? And I said to him, your eminence, these are people who would never believe that a prince of the church would sit with their grandson at a Shabbat table. <laughs> and that's a very, very great truth. And it is a great truth made possible, not just by the hard, holy work of the Catholic Church, not just by the hard, holy work of the Jewish community, but what we must never forget, especially in these American times, is that it is a relationship unique to the United States of America. There is something about American culture and American ideals that makes possible a Jewish-Catholic relationship, a Jewish-Christian relationship that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, except possibly for the exception of a certain fellow who used to be named Bergoglio, now known as Pope Francis may live and be well in the relationship he cultivated in Argentina. But the American ethos is what makes this very great relationship possible. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is in a certain sense a very easy church to read. Unlike the Jewish community, which speaks in so very many voices, in so very many documents. Uh, and one of the things I love about working with the Roman Catholic Church is there's basically one phone number. When I have to deal with the Protestants, it's a whole Rolodex. <laughs> um, but, but there's one phone number, there's one address. Um, and when you want to know what the church is thinking, there are critical official documents that have been the product of an enormous amount of research, scholarship, deliberation, and debate. But what I like most about the Roman Catholic Church is not its formal culture, but what I would call its discretionary culture. The ways in which three popes, John Paul II, uh, who by the way, uh, was not a native, but a fluent Yiddish speaker, uh, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis have interacted with Israel and with the Jewish people. Now, what I'm going to do really are tell you a few stories. And uh, if you open up the Torah, you know that the central messages, we're in the book of Bereshit, Genesis now, and our central messages in the book of Genesis are stories about real people and our brothers and sisters uh, in the Catholic Church are now in their holy season of Advent, and critical to their lectionary and liturgical readings are the stories found in the Gospels. In other words, faithful life is lived. 
Philosophers write about faithful life, but believers live faithful life. So I want to tell two or three, three stories actually, about three different popes and the way in which uh, they expressed their feelings, not in official settings, but in real life settings with the Jewish people and with Jewish history. First, the bishop referred to that remarkable moment when John Paul II was in Jerusalem in uh, March of uh, 2000. Now, um, people often forget that later that year, in June of 2000, he was in Ukraine. Um, and he was at Babi Yar, and he read uh, Psalm 26, Mima Matim Khaticha, O Lord, I call to you out of the depths, and where David meant the depths of his soul, John Paul II quoted that psalm to talk about the depths of despair that one encounters in a place like Babi Yar. Now, I was privileged to be in Jerusalem, not because I was invited, it was just an accident, uh, when John Paul II arrived. And I was even more fortuitous to be staying in a hotel that overlooked his route uh, <laughs> down Mamilla and uh, behind uh, the mall to Notre Dame. So, uh, and I was even more fortuitous that my room overlooked the street and that it had a balcony. It was just a set of accidents, unplanned. And the amazing thing was that as he traveled down that road, I got to see him for, what, 30 seconds? What was amazing to me were the kids and the young Israelis who were out there on the street greeting him and waving flags. Now, this is absolutely critical for a very simple reason. The Jewish community in Israel is the only modern Western Jewish community in the world that does not live side by side with a large majority Christian community. There are about 150 to 160,000 Christians living in the land of Israel. They are, by the way, the most uh, highly educated, most affluent, most materially safe, and most democratically secure Christian population in the entire region. It's also the only Christian population experiencing natural growth. The Catholic population in the Emirates is experiencing growth, but that's because of the import of Filipino uh, professionals and, and workers. And the reason it was fantastic to see John Paul II moving down that street was not so much him, but the natural way in which a whole bunch of Israelis, hundreds and hundreds, greeted him. And these are not Israelis who have a lot of familiarity with Christianity or with Christians. I have seven Israeli grandchildren. They really don't know any Christians. Uh, my son-in-law and daughter are pediatricians. They know a few Christians. But most Israelis don't. And this enormous natural outpouring of joy and of happiness and of welcome was a remarkable thing to see from that hotel room. I I've had no such luck with hotel rooms since then, so <laughs> that was just one moment. But then he went to the wall, and he inserted a prayer in the wall. He worked on that prayer with a fellow who at the time was known as Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, who was a man with whom he discussed a great deal uh, theologically. By the way, one of the biggest problems the church faces is that uh, uh, Benedict XVI left behind so many writings, it's going to take decades upon decades uh, for the church uh, uh, to acquit itself of a formal understanding uh, of, of everything that he has written theologically. Um, by the way, if you haven't read his three volumes on Jesus of Nazareth, uh, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, it's an astonishing uh, work, and every faithful Christian and Jew should read it. It's utterly remarkable. It's a work of scholarship that is accessible to those who are uh, simply, uh, uh, even those who are not schooled theologically. Now, 
the two of them worked on this prayer. And the text of the prayer reads as follows. God of our fathers, you chose Abraham and his descendants to bring your name to the nations. We all agree on that. That was the function of Abraham. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer. The bishop has already commented on that. And asking your forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. Now, number one, theologically this is significant uh, because the church, unlike certain other Christian denominations, while it believes that all of humanity must in the end uh, come to know uh, Jesus of Nazareth, nevertheless, and by the way, Jews have no business telling Christians what to believe. We don't want Christians to tell us what to believe. And so the notion of salvation only through Jesus is perfectly legitimate and to be respected by Jews. We don't tell one, one faith does not tell another faith what to believe. We do have a right to expect that uh, the Catholic witness to that uh, be consistent uh, with goodness and holiness as it is now. Now, in that statement, the people of the covenant, what John Paul II was declaring at the wall in Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish people, namely that the covenant that God made uh, with Israel as, as described in the Torah, has efficacy and is indeed still with us to this day, is deeply respected, and indeed in a recent document issued a year ago by Rome, Francis made it very clear that what Jesus is to the church, the Jew finds in the Torah, in the life of Torah and the learning of Torah. But even more remarkable than that was something that John Paul II didn't even say. It was the fact that he went to Jerusalem. That he went to Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish people into Israel, meant that he was witnessing that the Roman Catholic Church has no theological problem with the Jewish return to sovereignty in the ancient homeland. That really was the great witness that he made. Because indeed, as uh, the Deputy Consul General mentioned earlier, that was not something that Rome was prepared to state a hundred years earlier under Pope Pius X. Now, I want to turn to Benedict. I want to acknowledge that he was nowhere near as telegenic as John Paul II. Um, look, uh, like lots of rabbis, I was trained by German rabbis and by Polish rabbis. Okay, and the stereotypes are all true, whether you're Jewish or you're Catholic. So when Benedict became Pope, when John Paul II became Pope, he reminded me of teachers I had in Yeshiva, who came from Eastern Europe, and when Benedict became Pope, he reminded me of teachers I had in Yeshiva who were trained in Germany. So, despite the fact that he wasn't telegenic, despite the fact that he did not have the theatrical background, and John Paul II began, his career as an actor. I mean, he was a, a man of this world, which is why he was so effective. He was a skier. I wouldn't get on skis in a million years, but he was a remarkable man of the real world. Benedict was a scholar, and, and again, not telegenic, if, if, you know, he'll forgive me for saying that. But Benedict went to Auschwitz, and when he was in Auschwitz, on 28 May 2006, and we have to be careful, Auschwitz should never be a metonym for the Holocaust. A million and a half Jews were murdered in Auschwitz, but by the time a million and a half Jews were murdered in Auschwitz, four and a half million Jews had already been murdered. He went to Auschwitz, and he stood in front of the memorial plaque. It is written there in many languages. He stood in front of the one that was written in Hebrew. And then he noted, in referring to all these plaques, some inscriptions are pointed reminders. There is one in Hebrew. And he drew everyone's attention to that. And he said as follows, the rulers of the Third Reich wanted to crush the entire Jewish people. 
to cancel it from the register of the peoples of the earth. He's quoting the psalm here. Thus the words of the psalm, we are being killed, accounted as sheep for the slaughter, were fulfilled in a terrifying way. These vicious criminals, by wiping out this people, listen carefully now, wanted to kill the God who called Abraham, who spoke on Sinai and laid down principles to serve as a guide for mankind, principles that are eternally valid. If this people, by its very existence, was a witness to God who spoke to humanity and took us to himself, then that God finally had to die and power had to belong to men alone, to those men who thought that by force they had made themselves masters of the world. By destroying Israel by the Shoah, they ultimately wanted to tear up the taproot of the Christian faith. The moment I read this, I picked up the phone. I called my dear uh, friend, the late lamented, uh, uh, Francis Cardinal George, he passed away just two years ago this coming spring. We miss him deeply. I said, Your Eminence, I have to see you right away. Uh, I went over to the residence. Uh, it was early in the morning. We were both early morning risers, so if I wanted to get him before the whole Catholic community of Chicago fell in on him for the day, I got him at six in the morning. I went over there, I said, Your, Your Eminence, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. What Benedict has just said is <coughs> that the genocide of the Jewish people was not just a genocide, it was a deicide. And uh, Cardinal George said, yes, that's exactly what he said. He said to me, not only that, but you're forgetting, which I often do these days. Uh, the, the, the more grandchildren God blesses me with, the more my memory declines. Uh, he said, you're forgetting a few years ago, I reported on this in my monthly article in the Catholic New World after a conversation with uh, 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 the Pope when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger. He said, yes, the genocide of the Jewish people was in his side. I said, what you mean, what you're saying that 2,000 years after we parted ways and did not accept your understanding of the Torah, did not become Christians, nevertheless you are saying that the attempt to murder the Jewish people was a deicide? He said, yes. I said, in other words then, if that is a deicide, God is in our midst. God's presence is manifest in this world, in people Israel. And the Cardinal said, yes, that's exactly what Benedict means. It was an astonishing statement. That came uh, from the pen and the lips of uh, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, Benedict XVI. He made that towering and astonishing theological statement uh, in uh, Auschwitz itself. The attempt to murder the Jews was an attempt at deicide. That is a statement of profound and powerful reverence for an attachment to the Jewish people. And it was never in any official church document. Of 2013, a secular atheist, Italian journalist, I, I don't know which of those, Italian's fine. I'm trying to figure out whether I dislike journalists, secular or atheists more. I don't know. But in any event, he's a great, he's a great journalist. Um, his name was Scarfati. He uh, interviewed Francis in a very long interview. You can get it online. And uh, he then published it, published it in La Repubblica. Italian newspaper, and uh, he quotes uh, Francis in response to a question. You also asked me, in conclusion of your first article, what we should say to our Jewish brothers about the promise made to them by God. That's the interviewer's question. Has it all come to nothing? Believe me, this is a question, this is Francis, that challenges us radically as Christians. Because with the help of God, especially since Vatican Council II, 
we have rediscovered that the Jewish people are still for us the holy root from which Jesus germinated. In the friendship I cultivated in the course of all these years with Jewish brothers in Argentina, often in prayer, I also questioned God, especially when my mind went to the memory of the terrible experience of the Shoah. What I can say to you with the Apostle Paul is that God's fidelity to the close covenant with Israel never failed. And that through the terrible trials, by the way, so far there's nothing new. Now listen carefully. Through the terrible trials of these centuries, the Jews have kept their faith in God. It's an astonishing statement. It goes be way beyond the condemnation of anti-Semitism, which is not such a hard condemnation to make after the Holocaust. But here comes Francis, acknowledging that the Jews have kept their faith in God. Now listen carefully. And for this, for the Jews having kept their faith in God, we shall never be sufficiently grateful to them as church, but also as humanity. Francis said that the church and humanity will never be able to sufficiently express its gratitude to the Jewish people for their faithfulness in the one God. They then, precisely by persevering in the faith of the God of the covenant, called all, all us Christians, to the fact that we are always waiting as pilgrims for the Lord's return. Benedict is saying, Francis is saying something astonishing here. That, in the, that the church and humanity are indebted to the Jewish people for serving as witness to God during 2,000 years of torment and even during the Shoah. The Holocaust was a time when it seemed that all of Western humanity was divided into three groups. The murderers, the murdered, and the rest who were members of the tribe of folded arms. Those who were indifferent and silent, who in, eff in effect were partners to the murderers. It was a time when it seemed as if all of Western society, especially in Europe, once home to Christendom, had engaged in apostasy to this pagan faith called Nazism. And Francis says, in those deep, dark times and throughout the centuries, the Jews served as witness to the one God, never losing their faith. And for that, humanity and the church will never be able to sufficiently express their gratitude implicit in this statement is the fear that had we, the Jewish people, lost our faith in the one God, heaven forfend, during all the years of torment and the Holocaust, God knows what might have become of the belief in the one God in the rest of the world. Indeed, one of the greatest accomplishments that the Jewish people have to present to the world at this time is do not despair. We came out of Europe in 45 and in 48 decided to build life by establishing the state of Israel and by building a great American Jewish civilization here. Despair is absolutely forbidden. We maintained our faith in the one God and that gift of the Jewish people as noted here by Francis is a gift that in the coming days, weeks, months, and years, we will have to make ever more available. And despite our small numbers, uh, there are 2.2 billion Christians in the world, there are 14 million Jews, that's 0.006, it's not even a rounding error in the Chinese GDP. <laughs> it's a drop in the bucket. But we Jews are gonna have to make that lesson available. The faithfulness that Francis identified. So there are remarkable pictures out there, and you should uh, look 
uh, at all of them. But I wanted to present to you today three portraits of three papal events or incidents that were not so much a part of the formal but the discretionary culture of the church. The text of the prayer that John Paul II pr presented and placed in the wall, the very fact of his coming to Jerusalem, Benedict standing in Auschwitz as an old, frail, and by that point he was quite frail, as an old, frail man in a place where those of his own nativity had done what they did and declared with a might that only a great theologian can declare this was more than a genocide, it was a deicide, and the image of Francis sitting in Rome uh, talking to a secular Italian journalist and revealing to him a very great theological truth. We stood as witness during all the years of torment and during the dark years of the 1940s. We, the Jewish people, are fortunate to have not just those pictures that are out there, but very many wonderful images of popes interacting with us in the United States, in Europe, and in Israel, dating back to John the 23rd and forward. We treasure those images, and we deeply treasure this Jewish-Catholic relationship that is made possible by all of us and by this great civilization that we have all been built in the United States of America. Um, in this, your holy season, we wish you that as you grow ever nearer to our common Father in heaven, all the gifts that come of the Spirit, God bless you. Thank you.
our appreciation for you, but our lives are much richer for the spirituality you show, you exhibit in your own lives, and the knowledge that you share with your flocks. And finally, whatever your religious affiliation is, please know that we wish you a beautiful holiday season and a happy, healthy 2017. And thank you for sharing this program with us this evening. And now to the exhibit. Thank you.